and uh, welcome to the CLEAR webinar series on this St. Patrick's Day. I'm sorry to interrupt the, the great musical intro uh, that our presenters had for you, um, but did just want to sort of welcome you to this webinar. This is the second in our uh, 2015 CLEAR webinar series on uh, the emerald ash borer and the state of the uh, emerald ash borer here in Connecticut. And finally, before I turn it over to our presenters today, I just want to say a quick word. This is part of um, the Center for Land Use, Education, and Research's webinar series. Uh, for those of you who don't know, CLEAR is a program of UConn, uh, the Department of Extension and Sea Grant, and the Department of Natural Resources and Environment. And CLEAR basically serves as a, a resource for communities on, on issues like land use and climate change, water, and uh, geospatial technology and mapping. And so, uh, without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our presenters. Uh, presenters today are Na my colleague Nancy Merrick, who is also part of the Department of Extension here at UConn, and Chris Donnelly from um, from Deep. And I'm going to turn it over to Nancy first, right? Okay. Hello, welcome. <clears throat> Happy St. Patrick's Day. My name is Nancy Marek. I'm one of the Extension foresters at UConn. I'm sitting in my office at Middlesex County Extension Center in Haddam. Sitting next to me is my colleague, Chris Donnelly, the state urban forester. We're excited to be here today to have this conversation with you about how to slow the spread of the non-native insect called the emerald ash borer that is killing our native ash trees. This webinar is an hour long. For the first 10 minutes, I will explain how to identify an ash tree, what are the outward signs the tree will show under attack, and a little bit about the life cycle of the insect itself. Chris will then take over on, on the history of the emerald ash borer in Connecticut, the status of the infestation, quarantine information, and how the state is tracking the movement of the pest. It's back to me uh, with some management options available for woodland owners. Then Chris will take the challenges that face towns and homeowners, and finally we'll wrap it up and answer any of your questions. So let's begin. Uh, but first, on a side note, the emerald ash borer has been found in another native woody plant called the fringe tree, uh, Cyanthus virginicus. This plant is native to the southeastern United States. Both plants, the fringe tree and the ash tree, belong to the same plant family, the olive family. But for this webinar, we're only going to talk about the ash tree. So there are three kinds of ash trees in Connecticut, uh, the white, the black, and the green. Uh, the white ash, Fraxinus americana, although the most common species, is not the dominant tree in the forest. Ash trees only make up about 3% on average of the tree species found in Connecticut. This ash, uh, white ash tree distribution across the state with higher concentrations in the northwest and southeast section. Summer, but they should, I, I'd imagine they'd be so getting people saying map, that. Uh, it shows the distribution of each species across the United States. Ash trees grow in a wide range of habitats. The trees occupy certain ecological niches in the landscape. The white ash is mostly found on upland or music sites with well-drained soils, high in fertility. The green ash can be found Maybe we're Sorry about that. Uh, the green ash can be found along stream banks and wet sites and is planted as a street tree in the west. The black ash also resides on wet sites as well as uh, can adapt to swamp conditions. The black ash, by the way, is the ash tree used to make uh, beautiful baskets. Uh, the broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. The white ash. Uh, this slide just shows uh, start. white ash uh, is a pioneer species, uh, first to occupy the site after a disturbance. Uh, there was a button that said start. Wildlife value. Because it wasn't started. Here we are at the first part of how to identify an ash. Uh, it's a pattern on the bark. Um, no, the bark it's is not smooth, but develops ridges. And when the bark is mature, those ridges crisscross to a strong diamond pattern. So think of diamonds when you try to identify the white ash. Next, look up the canopy and determine the branching pattern. Uh, there are two types of branching patterns, opposite and alternate. Uh, this slide just shows the variation in bark of the black, the white, and the green ash. Uh, here we are, opposite branching pattern. Uh, there are two types of branching pattern, opposite and alternate. 
uh, notice how the smaller branches are arranged uh, when you look up into the canopy. Uh, you will see um, the twigs grow opposite one another. The maple group is the only other native uh, tree group to follow this pattern. The rest of the trees follow an alternate or offset type branching pattern as seen in this American beach picture on the left side. Now, once spring comes, and I assure you that spring will come, the leaves of the ash tree are called compound leaves. Oh, here are some very nice photos of the twigs. Notice, uh, according to the text that I've I've read the leaf scars look like letters of the alphabet. Uh, the green ash looks like the letter D, the white ash the letter C or a smile, and the black ash resembles an O. So the leaves. Uh, leaves of the ash are compound. Um, a, leaf, a compound leaf consists of one leaf stalk with several smaller leaflets attached. Uh, the sugar maple, which is the leaf to the right, as a, is a simple leaf, uh, one leaf, one leaf stalk attached to the twig. Ash leaves generally have five to nine leaflets, depending upon the species. And finally, the fourth characteristic um, is just green, the white, and the black, so all compound. Uh, just notice on the left side, there's a picture of the mountain ash. It's not a true ash, not affected by the EAB, uh, but uh, the common name is mountain ash. Uh, and here we are to the uh, seeds. Oh, sorry. Uh, fourth characteristic, uh, fruit matures in the fall and looks like a canoe paddle. It's a winged seed called a samara, and each kind of ash seed looks slightly different than the other. The ash tree is a source of food for many wildlife species. It is a host tree to several species of caterpillars, which feed on the leaves. Wildlife species that use the ash seed as, food, as a food source, to name a few, are the wild turkey, the cardinal, the red squirrel, and the wood duck. Since the ash tree is quick to decay, it will develop cavities that are used by owls, woodpeckers, and some mammals. Well, that's it for ash tree identification. Now we're on to the signs of uh, an EAB infestation. Uh, so it takes about two to three years before you might see any outward signs. So your tree could have already been attacked, but you don't quite see the signs yet. Uh, the changes will be subtle at first, a few dead branches at the top of the canopy, and some woodpecker activity. You may not notice the early signs or think anything of it. Just know that the emerald ash borer is in our state. If you have ash trees on your property, they most likely will get attacked. The goal is not to stop the insect at this point, but to slow the spread. So what does the damage look like? First, here is a picture of a healthy canopy on the left. And on the right, uh, the canopy has been greatly diminished by the activity of the immature form of the insect, uh, the larvae that are feeding just underneath, uh, inside the bark. Uh, this is a, a slide showing percentages of dieback. Once it gets to about 50%, uh, the tree is no longer uh, of economic value. So here we have another sign, uh, woodpecker activity. Uh, they are searching for the uh, larvae, the grubs underneath uh, the bark. And uh, at the same time, they are uh, pecking holes in their search and scraping off uh, parts of the bark, so you are seeing a two-toned appearance because of their activity. This is a, a slide, a, sh a shot taken in Bethany uh, not too long ago uh, with just uh, varying degrees of the two-toned bark. Uh, the tree in the foreground obviously is a, at the worst state, uh, and at the very bottom there are strips of bark uh, that will land on the ground because of the woodpecker activity. So it's something to look out for uh, while you're on, walking on your property. So other signs of serious infestation uh, are the water sprouts. Uh, once the tree uh, has significant damage, uh, it's a desperate attempt to send out shoots and collect sunlight uh, to stay alive. Um, and the last 
or the significant um, sign is a D-shaped exit hole at the bottom left corner. Uh, it's shaped like uh, a D, and there's a smaller, two smaller ones in the middle picture. The photo on the right, uh, show, just want to give you the difference uh, between the D-shaped exit hole and uh, the attempt of the woodpecker to search for the grub. So you might see, see these two uh, different signs uh, on the same tree. So now we are uh, done with the, the uh, signs uh, of attack. Uh, let's go into a little bit about the insect uh, itself. Uh, so what are the signs of, uh, so we've talked about some signs of the EAB attack, uh, and now we're uh, going to do a little bit, talk a little bit about the insect. Uh, the emerald ash borer is a wood boring beetle about a half inch long. It can fit inside a penny, if that helps to visualize. Uh, the wings are a brilliant metallic green with a bright purple abdomen. Uh, it's quite striking for an insect. Uh, the adults are active for only two weeks after they emerge from the D-shaped exit hole and feed on the leaves of the ash tree. Uh, they'll mate, and then the female will lay eggs on the bark, uh, about 40 to 100. Uh, the eggs will hatch, and the immature, immature stage uh, will tunnel through the bark and start feeding uh, underneath uh, in the inner bark layer called the phloem, uh, where it cuts channels through this layer, which disrupts the flow of nutrients throughout the system. This is how the, the branches will die, uh, one by one. Uh, the channels made by this activity are S-shaped and can be seen just inside the bark. There's a, a picture of an adult uh, with a beautiful striking purple abdomen and the flat-headed uh, cream-colored larvae uh, to the right. Uh, now let's just touch briefly upon the life cycle. Um, the, uh, the adults emerge from the uh, D-shaped exit holes around June uh, and start feeding for two weeks on leaves. Uh, the insects will uh, then mate. Uh, the female lays eggs on the bark. The eggs will hatch and tunnel uh, through the outer bark uh, and will feed for about one to two years, depending upon the health of the tree. Uh, they will overwinter and then uh, pop their heads out in June, as the top photo shows. <clears throat> this picture just is a very rough diagram of wood, uh, the different parts of the tree, uh, and to the right uh, just shows some uh, serpentine tunnels uh, that are caused by the larval activity. Now some EAB lookalikes uh, that you may see in your travels, uh, the bronze birch borer uh, in the far right corner, native to U.S., uh, feeds only on the uh, phloem just below the bark. Uh, and leaves also a D-shaped exit hole, but it's darker in color and doesn't feed on the ash trees, but prefers white barked birch trees. Uh, the six spotted tiger beetle in the far left is common in the eastern woodlands. It's also a native, a ground dwelling predator. Uh, the Japanese beetle, uh, enemy of all gardeners like myself uh, in the top right, uh, feeding over 300 species. Uh, especially roses, as all gardeners know. Uh, the two-line chestnut borer in the center bottom, also a native, attacks stressed oak trees. Uh, it also leaves a D-shaped exit hole. And lastly, the caterpillar, caterpillar hunter, uh, which is about an inch uh, long. The rest are about a half inch. Uh, it feeds on forest caterpillars and is active at night. Well, that's it for the introduction. Uh, to the ash, the signs of damage, and the insects. Now Chris will take over to talk about the history of EAB in Connecticut and the efforts to date in tracking its movement. Thank you, Nancy, and happy St. Patrick's Day. I I'm feeling a bit typecast with my last name it being St. Patrick's Day and being asked to talk about the Emerald Ash Borer. Um, but it is St. Patrick's Day, so let's go for it. I'd like to start out with pictures from Prospect, Connecticut in the summer of 2014. Uh, Prospect is the town in Connecticut in which the Emerald Ash Borer was first found uh, in the summer of 2012. At the time, 2012, 
Uh, there wasn't a lot of damage yet noticed to the trees, um, but at this point you can start picking out dead trees already uh, just from this, these aerial photos. White ash, as uh, Nancy men mentioned already, makes up only about 3% of the forest in Connecticut in general. But even at that low percentage, you can see the uh, degree of impact that the loss of, of those trees um, do have on a, on a community uh, forest. These pictures, by the way, were taken by the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, who has the uh, primary responsibility for monitoring the emerald ash borer. And so they've been very active in getting out and looking at these various sites. Um, they've noticed these uh, dead trees from the air and have gone out and ground truth and um, verified that, in fact, they are primarily ash trees. Um, so, and of course you notice not only there are uh, dead trees in, uh, in these pictures, um, as well as trees that are showing that off color. I don't know for sure if those are all ash trees, but very likely uh, trees that are showing the stress of the insect attack. At this point, I'd like to introduce a concept, that of the uh, EAB invasion wave curve, or as some people call it, um, the death curve or the killing front that's associated with the emerald ash borer. It's been noticed across the country as emerald ash borer has come into communities. As you look at this graph, uh, you'll notice off to the left, it's got percentage of maximum, so it's percentage uh, uh, scale. Down the bottom, it has years. The line that I've just highlighted in red uh, shows the affected ash trees. As Nancy mentioned, the difference between an affected ash tree and a dead ash tree is only about two or three years. Every tree that gets uh, significantly infested with uh, emerald ash borer, unless it's treated, will succumb to the insect. The second curve uh, is for the emerald ash borer itself. And of course, it's following the curve of affected ash trees. As the ash trees go from 0% uh, affected by EAB at the beginning of the timeline uh, to 100% affected uh, in about eight years, the population of emerald ash borer lags slightly behind that by a year or so until at some point all the ash trees are uh, impacted by EAB, um, all the trees are dead or near dead, in which, at which time the emerald ash borer population will move on to the next community. So um, as we look at this chart, uh, we divide it into three different phases. The first phase is the cusp phase, uh, during which the emerald ash borer population builds up. Importantly, there's no or very little visible symptoms. Um, very small percentage of the trees actually have emerald ash borer at this point, and many of them are just in the early stages. Consequently, emerald ash borer is very hard to detect at this point. However, we get four or five years into the infestation, and suddenly, um, as in those pictures from Prospect I was just showing you, it seems we have signs of emerald ash borer every year. Uh, the distress in the ash tree population is very evident. And then finally, we reach a, a post-crest phase. At this point, uh, all untreated ash trees are likely dead, um, and the emerald ash borer has departed that community for the next uh, um, community full of ash to attack. So what do we, now that we're face-to-face, eyeball-to-eyeball with the emerald ash borer, um, what do we do? Um, at this point, it's been recognized that the emerald ash borer is too well established in North America to be eradicated. Uh, the emerald ash borer was originally found uh, in North America in uh, Detroit, Michigan, and in Windsor, Ontario, uh, across the river from Detroit in 2002. Uh, in that time period, it has traveled uh, basically across uh, the U.S. Uh, from uh, Minnesota to New England uh, with outlying populations in Colorado, uh, Arkansas, uh, Louisiana. It's here. Uh, so the goal with EAB is not to eradicate it at this point, but to slow the spread uh, in the hope that or in the effort that um, there will be some response, whether it's response from nature uh, or potentially the trees themselves, um, that will then give the ash population a chance uh, to recover from this severe uh, infestation. 
and we can do our best good in our own roles of, of helping to slow the spread of ML dashboard if we take appropriate action early. So a lot of the effort to this point has been in detecting the ML dashboard. Um, many people are very familiar with the uh, purple traps uh, that have been set in trees uh, throughout the state. These uh, traps are basically uh, sticky uh, pieces of plastic, purple colored, because that's what attracts the emerald ash borer, and they're monitored uh, to see whether any emerald ash borers show up on these uh, traps. A second means of uh, detection is what's known as biosurveillance. Uh, we depend upon a wasp, a, a solitary non-stinging wasp called a Cicerus wasp, uh, and it goes out and collects uh, bupressed beetles in general, of which emerald ash borer is one. Uh, it stings the individual beetle, uh, brings it back to its burrow, uh, and feeds it to its young. Uh, we can monitor these wasps as they come back uh, to their burrow and see whether they're bringing in any emerald ash borers back. Or the third means of um, detecting emerald ash borer is to deliberately stress ash trees by girdling them. Uh, these stress trees will send out a signal that they're in trouble, which is a signal for uh, insects like the emerald ash borer to come calling, lay their eggs on these trees, and then, of course, we take these trees down at a later point in time and see whether, in fact, any emerald ash borers have found these trees. So what's our response? Uh, basically, uh, the state of Connecticut has established quarantines uh, with regards to animal dashboard. I'm going to take you through the, the history of that. In addition, there are regulations associated uh, with the quarantines. Um, I should mention that the quarantine um, responsibility belongs to the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. Um, they are the ones that have the authority to create quarantines. Of course, they are assisted in their work with the, uh, by the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, uh, in particular the Division of Forestry, as well as the Environmental Conservation Police. Um, working hand in hand with the state agencies are the federal agencies, the USDA Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, USDA APHIS, as well as the uh, USDA Forest Service. So uh, quarantines are in place. Uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about what the quarantines are about. Quarantines are established to control the movement of regulated articles. In, in the case of the Emerald Ash Borer, the regulated articles are items, uh, as you might expect, ash nursery stock ash soil logs, um, ash limbs and branches, uh, untreated ash lumber with the bark attached. Uh, it also includes firewood of all hardwood species. I'm going to come back to that in just a second. Uh, ash wood debris greater than uh, one inch in uh, two dimensions. I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> just reading the, the slide. Um, chips uh, greater than one inch in two dimensions. Uh, living or dead ash roots, log stumps, or branches as well as the emerald ash borer itself in any life stages. The reason, of course, that uh, this quarantine exists is that uh, ash is a valuable wood. Uh, it um, goes for, is used for a variety of products, from baseball bats to shovel handles to bodies for electric guitars uh, to uh, baskets. Uh, it also has value, of course, in the forest. Uh, the loss of the ash trees uh, will create a gap in the forest, uh, and there's a, you know, like any gap in the forest, there's a whole series of connected uh, organisms that depend upon ash trees, and so the problems will extend from there. So uh, when emerald ash borer was first found in Connecticut, it was 2012, originally in Prospect, uh, Connecticut, in north central New Haven County and then four towns surrounding uh, Prospect. Um, at that time, the Connecticut Agriculture Experiment Station met. They discussed uh, the situation with USDA APHIS and, and the other agencies, uh, and a decision was made to quarantine New Haven County. Each of those regulated articles that I just mentioned um, were restricted from moving out of New Haven County without uh, direct, strict and direct permission from the director of the Agricultural Experiment Station. 2013, the next summer, uh, Emerald Ash Borer showed up in 14 more towns. And so, I'm sorry, in nine more towns, uh, bringing the total to 14. Uh, and these included three new counties, Hartford, Litchfield, uh, and Fairfield County. So the decision at that time was made to extend the quarantine to these additional uh, three counties. 
So at this point, the four western counties of Connecticut are quarantined. 2014, uh, suddenly a huge drop in the number of towns. We're now up to 43 towns in six counties. At this point, uh, a question was, was faced. Uh, do we simply extend the quarantine to two additional counties, uh, or do we make the decision to quarantine the whole state? Finally, in, de um, in December of uh, 2014, um, the director of the Agricultural Experiment Station extended the quarantine to the whole state, although for bureaucratic reasons, um, in effect what they did is they rescinded the quarantine um, over the uh, four counties in Connecticut and joined Connecticut to the larger uh, national quarantine. I'll come back to that in a second, but first I want to just uh, make a, a, a side note, because I'm sure some of you are looking at this uh, growing list of towns and wondering where is Emerald Ashbore going to go next. Um, I certainly don't have the crystal ball. Uh, I don't have the insight into how Emerald Ashbore thinks, but I'll bring back up the map that um, Nancy had shown earlier of White Ash, and uh, you can see that the darker areas are the areas of highest concentration of ash throughout the state. Where EAB has been found so far uh, is not coincident with those darker areas. Um, so the potential for the Emerald Ash Borer to spread in Connecticut is very high still and will likely continue to spread. Um, so the federal quarantine. Um, you look at this map and the areas in green are the natural range of all ash species in uh, North America. Um, the red dots are finds of emerald ash borer throughout the United States. And then if you look closer at this map, you'll see a blue line. And the blue line is the uh, great big national uh, quarantine for emerald ash borer. Effectively, um, no, uh, none of that regulated material can be brought outside this blue line, but there is free movement of material within the blue line, uh, at least uh, according to the USDA APHIS rules. So, for instance, um, you could put a ash log on a truck in Kansas City, Missouri, and drive it all the way to Boston, Massachusetts, without violating the quarantine, because you're within that large blue line. Um, that's true for most of the regulated articles, but firewood is itself a separate situation. Um, and many of the states across the United States have um, reserved for themselves the um, ability to make regulations specific to firewood because, think about it, um, here we have a stack of firewood in somebody's backyard. Firewood is usually cut when a tree, often when the tree is still alive, or you know, any uh, insects living in the tree are still viable. Then it's uh, brought somewhere, uh, stacked, and perhaps left for a year or two to fully season. Any of those insects in the firewood have ample opportunity to move into the woods. Uh, if that firewood is being brought great distances, such as across state lines, um, it's a very effective way for insects to move, and is very likely the reason why the animal ash borer in uh, the course of a few short years was able to move from Detroit, Michigan, all the way to New England um, through the, the movement of firewood. So Connecticut is one of those states that has taken upon itself uh, regula uh, the uh, uh, authority to regulate firewood uh, because it is a major means by which emerald ash borer is spread. Um, this, these regulations apply to all hardwood firewood and not just ash firewood. And that's because for the typical user of firewood, it's difficult for them to tell an ash log from um, another type of hardwood log. Um, so it's better to just uh, regulate firewood as a whole. So in Connecticut, we have a series of regulations that apply to firewood. Um, these maps are available on the DEP uh, website. I'll have the uh, web address in just a second. Um, but I'm going to show three different situations. One is with regards to the movement of um, firewood within Connecticut. If you're bringing firewood, say, from Fairfield County uh, to Wyndham County, um, that's allowed. Um, there are no restrictions on the movement of that firewood. However, it is required that you be able to verify the source of that firewood. And our recommendation for verifying the source of that firewood is a document known as the um, In-State Firewood Transportation self-issued certificate of origin. 
basically, it's a document you can download uh, through the website at the bottom, um, and you list where you're uh, taking, where you got the firewood, and where you're moving it to. Um, and so um, that is a, a uh, requirement now under the state regulations that you have some sort of documentation, documentation to show where the firewood is from. Second scenario, the movement of firewood from Connecticut uh, out of state. If firewood from Connecticut is going to, say, Rhode Island or Westchester County or Vermont, these are all areas that are not part of the big national quarantine. So in moving firewood from a quarantined area, Connecticut, to these non-quarantine areas, you'd be running afoul of USDA APHIS regulations, um, which are regulations that have serious teeth to them. Uh, fines can be, although I doubt they would be in this case, but they can be as high as a quarter million dollars for the movement of uh, um, wood outside of the, the quarantine area. Um, as far as the movement of firewood to a, another quarantine area, individual other states also have their own regulations. For instance, New York State has very strict uh, rules as to the bringing in of firewood um, and would not be allowed uh, from Connecticut without special authorization. Um, so you need to be aware of those uh, regulations as well. And then finally, moving firewood into Connecticut, um, the part of the regulations adopted by uh, the state of Connecticut uh, require that if firewood is to come into Connecticut, it needs to be authorized, receive the uh, authorization from uh, the uh, director of the um, Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. So you can't just load up a truck in, say, Albany, New York, and drive it to Connecticut um, without first having contacted uh, folks at the experiment station uh, and gotten approval for bringing that firewood in, uh, which they likely would not do without having some sort of um, inspection of that firewood. If you do bring that firewood in, you run the risk of both confiscation of the firewood and, according to a bill that is now before the state legislature, um, uh, a, a fine for bringing that firewood into the state of Connecticut. So um, that's what the state uh, regulators are doing uh, to help uh, slow the spread of the uh, emerald ash borer. Uh, the emerald ash borer is already here in Connecticut. So, um, you know, we're, 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 we're just trying to contain it and slow its spread. We are also very concerned uh, about what's next. And we do have knocking on our border um, the Asian longhorn beetle, which is in both Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, and parts of New York State, including New York City and Long Island. Um, so these firewood regulations are also exist to help protect us from this insect as well. Thanks, Chris. Now I have the parts uh, about the woodland owner. Uh, so woodland management. Uh, so as a woodland owner, uh, the first step is taking stock of the trees in your woods. Uh, and my suggestion uh, to you would be to take a hike, uh, to get to know the trees in your forest, uh, bring along a tree identification book, uh, have some fun learning how to identify native trees. Do you see any ash trees? Uh, we gave you some pointers earlier in the webinar uh, to hopefully guide your way. Uh, can you tell how many trees? Uh, where are they? Uh, big trees, small trees, uh, all of this information is important. Uh, figuring out what kinds of trees you have in your woods, uh, maple, oak, or ash, is vital information and the first part in putting together a plan. The goal is to keep your woods healthy and productive. So why not create a plan to do that? You create a plan for just about everything else in your life. Consider developing a written forest management plan for your woodland to keep track of species inventory, tree health, and work done on the property. Working with a certified forester will be key in developing a sound plan. A link to a list of certified foresters in Connecticut is at the end of this webinar. The objectives of a forest management plan may include how many ash trees and, of course, other species are on the site, uh, the variety of species present, and how the other species may be affected after the loss of the ash population, uh, the quality of the trees, uh, their size and density in the woodland, 
and the presence of invasive species. Take the time to think about your goals and objectives as a woodland owner. Well, if you find some ash trees, don't panic and feel you must cut down every last one. You have options as a woodland owner. The idea is to slow the spread of the insect and take steps to minimize its impact while promoting diversity. But before any work is done uh, on your site, you should do one last thing, and that is to learn about the invasive plant communities that may be growing right now on your property. Eliminating those plants should be a priority before starting any work on site. This is a uh, photo of an ash tree stand that has been uh, decimated uh, by emerald ash borer. Uh, we don't want that to happen to your ash population. Uh, so uh, objectives. And here are some photos of uh, three of the biggies, uh, Japanese barberry, the left, uh, top left, uh, multiple rows uh, in the center, uh, and wing yuanmas. Uh, it's imperative to take care of this first uh, before you do any other work uh, on your site. Once the ash trees succumb, uh, there's a, a sun fleck, a spot of light on the ground. These guys will just zoom in and take over. Uh, so do the forest, uh, take care of the forest health and take care of the uh, invasive pests first. So, well, if you find some ash trees, uh, you know, don't panic, uh, and you'll have connected uh, with a certified forester. Uh, now, are there any wetlands on your site? Uh, if the ash trees are growing in a wetland, the best strategy may be to just leave them there and let the emerald ash borer run its course. Attempting to harvest those trees may damage the soil and harm the other species growing on the site. Besides, a few resistant varieties may be discovered after the rest of the ash trees have died, and those seeds could be collected to preserve genetic variation. Now we've covered the species mix, ash trees and wetlands, and those nasty invasives. Let's talk about the rest of your property. If you've identified the ash, uh, look for the two-toned bark. There's signs that there is a problem. Uh, and uh, again, there's a, a small little photo on the right corner of the strips of bark uh, that the woodpecker will remove. Uh, you may notice a D-shaped exit hole. Uh, these trees are too far gone to capture any economic value. Uh, as we said earlier, individual trees will die in two to three years after infestation. And ash wood falls apart when dry from decay. Uh, remove any hazardous trees first, such as those around uh, your structures or along the trail. Uh, be aware that some sawmills may not take dead ash logs and maybe eject those logs uh, from a tree uh, with a tree canopy that is 50% or, or more uh, of dieback. Uh, so it's important to talk to your forester uh, about the local markets. So if the trees are already dead uh, and not a hazard, uh, you could leave them as snags uh, snags are dead trees that are preferred that are preferred habitat uh, for a variety of wildlife uh, like birds, mammals, and amphibians. Uh, this is a pileated woodpecker. Uh, if the trees are small, you could cut them down and create brush, brush piles for wildlife. Uh, these piles act as safety zones and provide cover for birds and other small animals. Uh, you could also use the tree, small trees as firewood. Uh, it's Chris talked about earlier, uh, but keep the firewood on your property. Uh, the inner bark and wood uh, will eventually dry out in 6 to 12 months and no longer be a suitable host for the insect. So if you suspect the trees are still alive, uh, I would contact a certified forester. Uh, just because you don't see the signs of damage doesn't mean the insect hasn't invaded your woodland. A certified forester will help you create a plan in reducing the emerald ash borer density on your property by reducing the food source. Uh, creating a more diversified woodland may reduce the threat of future attacks on a single species, uh, like our glorious maples uh, coming up from uh, Asian longhorn beetle. Uh, if you have lots of ash trees uh, and they show no out outward signs of infestation, uh, then harvesting the larger ones may be an option to capture the value of the wood. 
Uh, other tree species may be a part of the harvest that removes ash. Uh, a mixed species sale may attract more buyers and result in more profit. Again, work with a certified forester to make sure the health of your forest is maintained. Uh, and again, uh, don't move uh, firewood, burn it where you buy it. Uh, so a uh, little uh, summary on what we just talked about. Uh, and by the way, uh, your neighbors uh, may be facing the same situation as you are. So it won't hurt to work with them uh, to implement a joint harvest and, and keep down the harvest of, of setting up, uh, keep down the cost of uh, setting up a timber harvest. I would love to have neighbors that hug trees like that. Uh, so remember, uh, there's no right strategy for every woodland because uh, every property is uh, unique. Uh, so just to go over briefly um, about young woods and mature woods, uh, the trees are small. I uh, reduce the overall abundance uh, of ash in the woodland, uh, but don't eliminate it. Uh, keep the ash that compete with the kill the ash that compete with the more desirable species. Uh, and ash does make uh, great firewood. Uh, in uh, mature woods uh, or those with a lot of ash, a harvest could take place to capture the economic value. Uh, those woods with an abundance of ash may be dramatically affected. Uh, a mixed species composition uh, should be the goal. Uh, ideally, the woods will regenerate nat uh, naturally, uh, but if this strategy is unsuccessful, however, uh, native trees could be planted as long as, uh, emphasis as, in as long as those trees are protected from deer browse. Uh, so you will have to uh, nurture these trees for a few years uh, to protect them from uh, deer activity. So infested trees, uh, other trees, infested trees should be removed uh, to ensure developing larvae will not emerge. Uh, ways to do this, uh, chip, grind, debarking, and burning. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, ash trees may not show outward signs for years after the initial attack. Uh, they grow in a variety of habitats. Uh, seriously consider developing a written forest management plan. Uh, contact uh, your local certified forester and take the time to consider all your options. Uh, again, there is no right strategy for all woodlands. And now I hand it over to Chris. Uh, this is Dave Dixon. I'm just going to intercept for a second. Um, I guess some of you were not on in the first couple minutes uh, when I mentioned this, but there is in the toolbar on your computer screen a little question box. If you have questions for Nancy or Chris throughout the presentation, please feel free to just type one in there, and they will um, pause if necessary to answer that question, or we will at least have questions at the end um, and uh, answer them all at that time. I'll turn it back over to Chris now. Thanks, Dave. Um, yeah, I, before I go into my next section, I wanted to just go back to a point. I'm not sure I um, made the point um, fully. Although in Connecticut it is um, legal to move firewood from one part of the state to the other, we're within one, you know, uh, quarantine within Connecticut. Um, certainly it's not helpful or smart uh, to carry firewood, especially from an area known to be infested, to an area that's uh, not yet known to be infested. Uh, show that map that showed those concentrations of ash. Um, certainly. I wouldn't want to be the one to encourage people to take uh, firewood from, say, Prospect or Middlebury and bring that to, uh, to one of those towns that does not yet have emerald ash or, or in it. Okay. Um, the next section is, is actually geared more towards uh, municipalities, cities and towns, as well as uh, private property owners. This is the view from the top of East Rock uh, in New Haven. And um, indeed, uh, New Haven, like much of Connecticut, um, consists of people and trees living very closely together. Uh, we mentioned earlier that about 3% of the trees in total in Connecticut are ash trees. That same proportion tends to hold true in most of the street tree surveys I've seen. Um, that ash is a small but significant component of the urban forest. One of the things about ash trees is that after they die, 
they tend to be very unforgiving. This is in a tree that's been attacked by the emerald ash borer, is nearly dead, um, and very shortly, um, you know, after it reaches this condition, it's going to stop drop, it's going to start dropping limbs. Um, and certainly, living that closely to, or existing that closely to people, um, that's not a condition that that anybody would encourage or tolerate. This is not uh, an ash tree. This is, happens to be an elm tree that succumbed to Dutch elm disease. Um, but this illustrates the concern. Uh, you can see you've got those large limbs. They're over utility wires. They're over sidewalks. They're adjacent to houses. They're adjacent uh, to roadways. Um, at least with elm, you've got some uh, ability to, to wait a little bit before needing to uh, take this tree down with ash trees. It's, uh, it's already an issue if it's at uh, this point. Um, so uh, one of the advantages we have here in Connecticut is that, um, sad to say, uh, the states in the upper Midwest uh, have been dealing with emerald ash borer now for better than a decade. Also, the ash populations uh, in those states tend to be higher. Uh, it's not unusual in a community out in Ohio or uh, Indiana to have 25% or more ash trees. Um, and certainly you can see the significance of the impact of uh, those trees when they go. Um, and so some of the concerns that uh, exist once we've, you have emerald ash borer in the community are certainly safety. Trees will tend to break apart. Um, that the trees that uh, have had the tops die due to emerald ash borer, the root, but the roots still alive will tend to sprout and, and block sight lines. Uh, once the trees are taken down, stumps are a hazard. Um, there's the loss of property value and of community spirit, uh, loss of the ecosystem benefits associated with those trees. Communities face accelerating costs, and those uh, responsible for uh, tree management um, have to deal with issues relating to predictability, uh, the public's confidence, uh, as well as communication issues. Um, as far as that sense of community spirit, I just wanted to include this pair of slides. This is not uh, emerald ash borer. This is Asian longhorn beetle in Worcester, Massachusetts, a before picture. And this is the exact same street uh, after trees have been removed due to the Asian longhorn beetle. Um, this is the sort of thing that I'm talking about with regards to community spirit. Fortunately, um, Purdue University out in Indiana has created a tool, researchers out there, uh, called the Emerald Ash Borer Cost Calculator. This web-based tool is, is, has the potential to be very helpful to urban foresters uh, making decisions about ash tree management, particularly with regards to dealing with the costs associated with EAB. Um, I would want to be sure I give credit where it's due. Uh, the only one to the left is Gabriella Doria. Uh, she worked for DEP last year, uh, and she did um, the bulk of this work with regards to the Emerald Ash Borer Calculator. I'm primarily using her slides. The gentleman to the right is Bud Neal, who's also been a great help in helping us find new infestations of the Emerald Ash Borer. That's a tree they're peeling away the bark of, and you can, if you look closely, you can see the serpentine galleries. Um, I'm going to give you Gabriella's conclusions first. Um, with regards to the emerald ash borer um, and the cost calculator, uh, she concluded first that the EAB infestation is hard to detect before year four to five. Uh, we already talked about that. It's, uh, you just don't see the, uh, uh, the degree of uh, mortality in the trees as well as uh, signs and symptoms from the EAB damage. Tree inventory is going to be very helpful in the use of the tool. We'll see that in a second. Um, proactive response, uh, knowing what you're doing, is going to reduce the costs, especially short term. Um, treatment and replacement strategies help promote canopy recovery, and it is important to consider tree benefits. A curve that we saw earlier uh, showing the affected ash trees in the emerald ash borer uh, with the added two blocks up on top, dividing the management uh, uh, activities into two phases. The aggressive phase, uh, while the emerald ash borer is still in the community, and then the maintenance phase in which um, you work with any ash trees you manage to save uh, that will, will continue to be part of the urban forest. Now, I'm not going to take you through the entire scenario uh, that Gabriella does in the paper she wrote, which is available. Again, I'll show you on the DEP website a little bit later. Um, but basically, she considered four different strategies for dealing with emerald ash borer and used Milford as her 
test case because we had a complete inventory thanks to the group in Milford, Milford, uh, uh, Milford Trees Incorporated, which had completed this in inventory a few years back. Uh, the strategies involved remove all ash trees, uh, remove and replace the ash trees as they become unsafe, plant them with a different species, uh, replace all ash trees less than 24 inches and treat those larger than 24 inches in diameter, or save half the ash trees uh, and treat them and remove the rest. Um, and she also set the simulations on uh, two points in time, year zero or year four. Year zero being when you are thinking maybe emerald ash borer might be in your community, or year four when you're really starting to see the trees go. Um, and it's also based on treatments uh, using merit, uh, which is a, a, less, uh, a, a treatment that is less expensive than other treatments. Um, and these uh, are the sorts of numbers she came up with. And again, I'm not going to go into these numbers other than to point out to you that um, they can be a great help in helping a community determine uh, what options they might want to take. So uh, the light blue line is the replace unsafe ash. Uh, so remove trees as they become dangerous and replace them with other trees. Uh, being proactive, starting before you know emerald ash borer is in the community, the peak cost is $79,000 a year for, for the city of Milford uh, in one year dealing with the, the emerald ash borer. Uh, on the other hand, uh, removing those unsafe trees and replacing them in, the, in, in a single year, numbers might top $115,000 um, by being more reactive rather than proactive. Um, similarly, you can compare using this tool, uh, various options such as uh, replacing trees uh, less than 24 inches, uh, which is the, the purple line, uh, saving half the trees, and they, you come out with different uh, cost comparisons. This is what the tool is created to do. Uh, and don't forget, look, using a tool like this, that um, it's not just uh, the cost of removing the trees. Uh, you also have to think in terms of what the urban forest is going to be like after uh, you've dealt with the trees that, uh, you know, that need to be removed. Uh, what do you want that urban forest to look like? And so as part of this tool, um, this is the total uh, uh, DBH of the trees remaining, you know, at various points uh, during the treatment period from, you know, year one to year 25. Uh, you know, the yellow line is to remove all uh, ash trees, and certainly by the end of uh, year 9 or 10, all ash trees are gone, uh, whereas replacing ash trees less than 24 inches and keeping the larger ash trees, that's that purple line, um, and you end up with a significant urban forest at the end. So uh, that's the EAB cost calculator, um, a very useful tool. This is the website to uh, get your uh, cost calculator. It's not difficult to use. It's easy enough to figure out. It's helpful to have an inventory, but if you don't have an inventory, you can borrow one from you know, a nearby town that's going to have similar conditions to your community. Um, it's helpful to know the cost you're going to have to deal with, including the cost of removal of the trees, um, as well as treatment costs and have various strategies in mind. And that's the, the beauty of this tool, is that you can apply these various strategies and, um, and see how it goes. Um, in addition to the cost calculator, um, it's important to keep the um, benefits of these trees in mind as well. Uh, this is also from Gabriella's work in her paper, um, comparing the benefits that come from just the ash trees uh, in the city of Milford. Uh, and she compared all ash trees, 518 trees out of about 15,800 trees, or approximately 3%, uh, and then just the larger ash trees, those greater than 24 inches, which are only 44 uh, trees total in the um, Milford inventory. Um, but the annual average benefit per tree of all ash trees was around $125. Uh, the net annual benefits of the, those 518 trees cumulative, about $65,000. On the other hand, just the larger trees, uh, $281 per tree, uh, and an aggregate benefit of uh, over $12,000 from those 44 trees. In other words, uh, larger trees provide more benefits. Uh, so and in this case, 9% of the ash trees are providing 20% of the total benefits. And we're talking about things such as energy conservation, air quality improvement, um, carbon dioxide sequestration, and so on. Um, and this is all determined using the iTree tools. Um, 
I3 streets. Um, so, uh, you know, what should you do about um, the ash trees in your community? Um, it, off to the left is a good friend of mine, Sister Ozan, and she'd probably agree that prayer is helpful. Um, but this is actually a meeting of licensed arborists in Connecticut, uh, learning about um, the various tools they might use, including pesticides. If we are going to save ash trees in our community, um, then we are going to, pesticides is a, a very valid option and, and the only one that's going to uh, save trees through the infestation period, through that um, invasion front. Um, the, this particular treatment being used is a uh, systemic that's injected uh, into the root collar of the tree. Uh, you can see that hose that goes around the base of the tree um, is then anchored into the tree at those individual points. Um, you can see that the drill the technician is using in order to drill into the base of this tree. Uh, that somewhat oversized lunchbox in the back uh, is, has a pump in it as well as a reservoir for the uh, chemical to be used. Um, and it's being used to, to uh, this tree um, is very, very likely to have emerald ash borer in it, um, but it's still relatively healthy. And that's part of the good news that emerald ash borer does respond to treatments. Um, and, and it can be controlled. To learn more about these insecticide treatments, um, there's a great publication that's available through uh, emeraldashborer.info, a website. Um, it's insecticide op uh, options for protecting ash trees from the emerald ash borer. Uh, it has, for instance, uh, tables such as this in the, uh, um, the publication, uh, downloadable PDF, uh, talks about the individual chemical treatments, um, how they're used. Um, most of these treatments are intended for use by professional applicators. It certainly would be my recommendation if you're a homeowner in Connecticut uh, to consult with a uh, licensed arborist uh, before you determine to do anything. Uh, but um, there are products that are intended for sale to homeowners that, that could also be applied uh, to help protecting a tree. Um, if you know that emerald ash borer is nearby, and again, this is covered in this, this publication, it's probably a good idea to begin treating any ash trees you want to keep. Um, and the only way you're going to keep ash trees once EAB hits your community, unless we get lucky with the response, is to use some sort of pesticide treatment. Um, so uh, going back to municipalities, um, this is not the slide I wish I had. I wish I had a slide. Uh, that I have in mind that shows uh, ash trees at the head of South Main Street in Southbury, uh, young ash trees that have been treated. Um, and it makes a lot of sense for the town of Southbury uh, in that case to treat these trees. They're, they're uh, great young healthy trees in a prominent location. Emerald ash borer is rampant in that community, um, yet it makes sense to invest additionally in these trees to keep them through that aggressive phase into that maintenance phase. Um, and it probably makes sense for this homeowner as well uh, with this large ash tree at the head of their driveway. So again, Gabriella's uh, conclusions, uh, EAB infestation is hard to detect before the uh, first uh, four or five years because it's at such a low level, uh, but there's no restriction at that point. The population will just explode. Uh, tree inventory is helpful uh, if you uh, are planning your response. Uh, proactive response reduces short-term costs. Treatment and replacement strategies will promote canopy recovery. Um, so as you're taking trees out, put trees in, and it's important to consider the tree benefits. Um, it's also important, again, from the municipality's perspective, if there's an opportunity to get the public involved. Um, there are lots of good programs that encourage the public to identify what an ash tree is uh, and monitor that ash tree. Let the tree warden know, let the, uh, the town officials know, uh, you know, what's going on with that particular ash tree. And so we're not all uh, uh, doom and gloom. Um, there are hopeful signs on the horizon. Um, the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station has been um, test releasing wasps that are parasitoids of EAB. Um, three wasps in particular have shown potential. Uh, the first and third are being released by especially Dr. Claire Rutledge down at the experiment station. Uh, the small wasp on the, at the bottom, Uubius agrilli, is an egg parasitoid. 
that's an emerald ash borer egg that she's laying her egg on. Um, potential to, to get that response. If we slow the spread, um, if controls become established, uh, there is hope for the recovery of the ash trees. Uh, a couple of references, uh, that paper that I referred to uh, with Gabriella uh, is available on the DEP forestry website, uh, ct.gov slash DEP slash forestry. Uh, also, you can go to www.ct.gov slash DEP slash EAB. Uh, there's very good information on the Agricultural Experiment Station website, ct.gov slash CAES, um, as well as uh, a definite uh, website to visit, emeraldashboard.info, which has just a ton of useful information regarding the emerald ash borer. Um, need more information? Um, mentioned uh, these links already. Uh, this is great, Nancy. Um, <laughs> and we want to thank uh, especially uh, Dr. Rutledge, uh, Gabriella, um, Hannah Reichley, uh, who contributed some slides, Bud Neal, Sandy Angelis, uh, folks at, the, at UConn here, and wish you all happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, we, we do have time for questions. Yeah, sorry, this is uh, Dave Dixon again. If you do have questions at this point, please type them into the question box. It's on your little GoToWebinar toolbar, and uh, we will see them and answer them. But we do have a, a couple questions already. Go ahead, Chris. Okay. Um, yeah, the first question is, uh, even before EAB was found in Connecticut, it seemed like ash trees were in decline. Um, that's true. Um, can we talk about the difference between EAB and other diseases that affect ash trees, such as ash yellows and anthracnose? Um, that's, that was one of the first observations uh, many people made once when they heard that emerald ash borer was, had arrived in Connecticut. Oh, the ash trees are already in such trouble. Um, wow, is this going to make a difference? Well, um, the concern is that this would be the, the, uh, the final blow to these ash trees, that uh, emerald ash borer would, would, has the potential to completely knock the population out. Um, the, there are differences uh, in when you look closely at the tree. Um, Nancy talked about some of the signs of, of emerald ash borer and how different they are. Um, Nancy, you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, it's a, a matter of uh, maybe creating a checklist of the different signs that you might see. Uh, on the trunk, uh, in the upper canopy, uh, you're not going to see the, uh, a lot of woodpecker activity. Uh, the two-toned appearance of the bark, uh, and the, the D-shaped uh, exit holes, and certainly not the serpentine gallery. So uh, it's looking a little closer, maybe taking some notes. Yeah, EAB does tend to start the infestation uh, in the upper part of the crown of the tree. Um, so that's where you'll see the problem first. Um, it's interesting, just this weekend a paper came out, or I came across it this weekend, uh, and it talked about... Uh, one of the early indicators of emerald ash borer is that you'll have uh, branches uh, failing and breaking off in the canopy and breaking off close to the trunk of the tree. Uh, because of the activity of the emerald ash borer, it's going to start feeding at that lower part of the branch. And so, you know, those are, those are the sort of subtle uh, uh, indications. Uh, you know, anthracnose has different signs. Uh, you know, ash yellows, you tend to see more of the witch's broom that uh, that's indicated, indicative of, of ash yellows. So there are subtle differences in the, you know, between the, uh, the, the different uh, problems for ash trees. Um, there, there's no more questions uh, that people have typed in, but I do have one, if you guys don't mind. Um, I'm just wondering sort of how fast um, this is, can be expected to happen. So in Prospect or in Southbury, where it's really um, sort of an issue right now, how quickly are sort of is the inventory of ash trees being affected? Do you know that information? Or? Well, um, yeah, thanks, Dave. Uh, I'd go back to the um, the um, um, infestation wave uh, diagram, and it basically, it's it's a complete exponential curve. Uh, you know, each year the the population uh, basically can be expected to double. There's nothing uh, inhibiting the growth of um, the emerald ash borer once it's in a community, except for the number of ash trees 
uh, and the rate at which the insect reproduces. Um, so, you know, the, the experience out in the Midwest is uh, within, you know, eight to ten years, um, an entire community's worth of, of ash tree can be destroyed. Um, how quickly is it moving across the state? Um, it's hard to say. Uh, you know, you, you saw the rate at which, uh, you know, we're discovering new towns that have EAB in them. That doesn't mean that those are towns newly infested. They likely had emerald ash borer already in them for, you know, two, three, four, five years. Um, how long will we keep discovering new infestations at that rate? Um, there's a lot of towns still in Connecticut, and, you know, as I said earlier, that um, the areas of highest concentration of ash, uh, you know, even yet don't, haven't had emerald ash borer found there. Right. Do have one more question here. Let me jump back to the screen that showed the pesticides. Okay. Um, yeah, let me go back. Uh, there was a question about the screen that shows the... Uh, the uh, uh, pesticides, we're bringing that up now. There we go. Uh, so this is from the publication. Um, go to emeraldashboard.info, uh, and you w will pretty easily, pretty readily find this this publication up there. Um, it's a PDF. You can download it, and uh, a lot of very helpful information um, that will be uh, of value to homeowners as well as professionals. I would also like to mention that Rich Coles, Dr. Rich Coles at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, has a very good uh, shorter paper uh, available on the Agricultural Experiment Station website. Okay, I think that's all the questions that we uh, have today. I want to take the time to thank Chris and Nancy for what I think was an excellent presentation and for taking the time to put it together for us. And uh, wish you all a happy St. Patrick's Day. Thanks, folks. <laughs>